both. So, so I was in the Navy for over 20 years. My service included both active duty and reserve time. It included service in the States as well as overseas on a couple different deployments with the Marines. Did you, did you deploy during deployment? So I had two tours over in Iraq as a battalion surgeon with the uh, Marine unit that I served with. Some of this may. It's just, it's very interesting. Of course. <laughs> well, everyone brings their own uh, perspective to it, right? Right, right. right. exactly. Um, oh, and somebody else said, okay, doctor, let's just uh, kind of go over, since we weren't there for the news conference, um, can you just explain to me about the intake and, and what happened when you arrived? Sure. So we were notified by an outside hospital, Alice Hyde Hospital on the Canadian border, that they had patient David Sweat, that they were looking to transfer to our hospital. That call came in at 4.45 on Sunday afternoon. So as per our normal routine, we accepted the patient and transfer. That's something we do approximately 11,000 times a year, take transfers from other hospitals, including from Alice Hyde Hospital. The difference in this case is that we knew that there was not only clinical but non-clinical things that we needed to coordinate. So as a result of that, we activated our incident command system. Our administrator on call came in and we started to assemble the team that would be responsible for coordinating the clinical and the non-clinical aspects of the care of this particular patient. And, and when that team came in, tell me what happened right. next. So we drill this. Uh, we don't drill it for this particular scenario, but we drill what it's like to coordinate different services. So our administrator on call uh, assembled the team that included people from security, people from our public relations department. Obviously, we needed to include the clinical providers to be sure that when the patient arrived, we had in place the resources to care for him. And do you have patients like this all, all the time? Someone uh, who's con who has gotten so much attention and someone who's considered so dangerous? So the medical center takes care of over 35,000 patients a year. Like most academic medical centers, we take care of a whole range of patients. I mean, I think it would be an obvious statement that this case is relatively unique as far as the media coverage that came with him. But as far as the patient himself, not unique? What do you mean in particular? Because he is considered, at least by the public, to be so extraordinary, so dangerous. Right. So the medical center does, in fact, take care of patients. Oh, okay. Um, this particular patient, considered so dangerous, a unique situation for you? Not entirely unique. The medical center does take care of patients under guard all the time in various different settings, emergency department settings, outpatient settings, inpatient settings. So um, while we, you know, that represents a very small minority of the patients we care for, we are familiar with and used to taking care of patients like that. And the, all the other people who support the, the medical director, for the, the treating physicians, are they all trained in this as well? So everybody receives training on how to handle patients who are under guard. Uh, in particular, we have a part of the hospital where uh, patients will go, which sort of represents a locked unit, and the people who work on that unit receive additional training as well and competencies on how to care for those patients. Can, can you tell me a little bit about what locked unit means? So imagine a jail. That's sort of the look and feel that it has. Uh, when you walk into it, 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 there's bars that would open and close, similar to what you would see jail cell and in fact when you even to get onto the unit you have to show ID you have to make sure that you remove from your personal belongings your phone and other things like that so that you can walk in just like you would into another jail setting how many people are there at one time how many physicians and nurses are there so the unit can hold up to 10 patients our average census there is 8 to 10 patients we have a contract with the New York State Department of Corrections, so that's why we, among other hospitals in the state, we're not unique in this area, but in this region we're unique, have a contract to take care of patients who come from the Department of Corrections. And the patients who are inside, are they you know, high-level security risk people? They could be. Uh, interestingly, the providers never get into understanding why they're in jail in the first place. That's not something that we ask. It's not relevant to what we're treating them for. Obviously, they're under guard. They have two security personnel with them at all time from the Department of Corrections. We also are augmented by our own AMC security who do a great job. And so we just focus on taking care of the patient and why they're there is not something that uh, we ever get into. In this case, uh, you mentioned that he's unique. You all know why he's there. 
does that change your perspective as a physician? It shouldn't, and we, we don't expect it to. Uh, it, it has nothing to do with what you're treating. It doesn't change the pathology of the patient. It doesn't change the disease state. It doesn't change the medications we're going to use. As I said the other day at the press conference, where you get into trouble is when you try to alter your plan based on something different than what you would normally do. So if you just focus on treating the patient the same way you would treat any patient, then things should proceed the way they're supposed to. If you try to alter that because of who the patient is for notorious reasons or VIP reasons, that's when you get into trouble. Our physicians and nurses and, and the people treating this particular patient, do you, do you uh, respond uh, to a different calling? I mean, how is it that you're able to do that? Because a lot of people are watching this and saying, ah, we know all about this guy, we know what he did. How are they possibly able to treat him? So I think like in all circumstances, you really just focus on the patient. Uh, let, let me speak specifically to the staff who works on our locked unit. I mean, those are nurses primarily who uh, work in an environment that they feel like that's a very important part of what we do here. Uh, the prison population is something that still needs health care. Uh, they feel like they have a very good working relationship with the guards who come from the Department of Corrections and they feel that they're part of a team. Uh, again, they're not judgmental. They're there really just to care for the patient, and uh, so I think that fear doesn't come into play because they feel like they're providing care in an environment that's safe to do so. And have you, have you personally been able to be on that locked unit when he has been there? I, 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 first of all, Albany Medical Center is not confirming where he is in the hospital. I have been on that unit in the past, so I can speak to what it's like to be on that unit, but uh, again, we're not saying where he is at this time. Is it just for you uh, personally? Is it scary to be in that unit? I don't think I would call it scary. I think the first time you walk on a unit like that, it certainly has a different feel. Right? So normally you would work on walk onto a medical unit and you feel like you're on a medical unit. The first thing that happens when you walk onto a locked unit is it has a different feel. There's a, there's a door that opens and closes. There's the sound of the rattling of the cage. There's the turning over of the, the wallet and your keys. So, you know, you can't help but feel this is a different unit. Once you get into the patient room, it's about taking care of the patient. So there's the stethoscope, and there's the way to look in the ears, and there's the patient on the, on the gurney, and you're examining them. And so that feels very medical. Um, I think, oh, the condition. I, I know, just, you know, sticking to what your statements have been, so I sure. don't push you too far, but right. uh, can you just tell me how, what his condition is right now? So Mr. Sweat arrived in critical condition. Uh, he had sustained injuries that had been reported by the state police, uh, so his condition was consistent with that. Over the course of the last several days, his condition has improved, so he went from uh, critical to guarded, and currently his condition is fair. So each of those represents an improvement in his clinical condition. And you're still anticipating that he'll be here a little while longer? So he's uh, currently here, and we would anticipate him to be here a couple more days. Is there anything you'd like to ask? Well, I, I don't know if you could. Well, there's two things. One, um, and I know you already touched on this a little bit, but the, the sweat has not only broken out of Clinton Correctional, but also a prison before that. So he's the type that, you know, I'm sure state police would be worried with your facility. I'm sure it's a locked facility, but is it, do they ask you how confident are you that we can keep this guy here and he's not going to break out if he has a history of doing so? Right. So, I mean, if the, the question is how confident do we feel that this patient is not going to escape from the hospital? I feel very confident. I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, under normal circumstances, when prisoners or patients under guard come in here, uh, all security precautions are taken, including when appropriate shackling of hands and their wrists. Obviously, we talked about the locked unit. There's always a significant number of security personnel with them. So at this point, I have no reason to believe that he's an escape risk from this hospital. Uh, as importantly, I, I feel like he's in no way a risk to hurt on any other patients or staff at our hospital, which of course is of paramount importance to us. Are, are these doors, each of the patient doors, they also have security? There is security presence on our locked unit. Uh, there's two per room. There's also a guard posted at the front of the unit. And as I mentioned, there's a door that opens and closes in a manner similar to what you would expect when you walk into a jail. So there are two guards inside the room. There's one guard outside the patient door. There, there's, there's always two guards on every patient. In addition to that, there are additional security personnel on the unit as well. So it's it's a very robust security presence. Is he currently shackled? Uh, I can't speak to uh, uh, this particular patient. I would tell you that in general, when, when pe people under guard are in the hospital, they are shackled.
Is there anything else left? I mean, I'm, it's, I didn't realize that you guys have done this for so long and you know exactly what you're doing and the <laughs> nurses, like you said, have, your nurses are volunteering almost, it sounds like, for that unit and they, they really feel that the prisoners shouldn't be treated any differently than regular. I mean, I, I'm sure that Sweat seeing that and seeing the good care he's getting here, has he been appreciative? I mean, can you say anything about that? So the nurses who the nurses who work on our locked unit are uh, like any other nurse in the hospital there because they choose to be on that particular unit. It's not dissimilar to a nurse who chooses to work on the labor deck or work in the emergency department. I cannot specifically speak to what Mr. Sweat feels or thinks about the staff. I haven't spoken to him, so I don't know what his opinions are. I would imagine that, uh, like any other patient in our hospital, he thinks he's heading the best care that he can get. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I, I do have one other question. Your military service, does that come in handy in this particular uh, area of the hospital? Uh, well, I mean, people who serve in the military are used to uh, dealing with complex situations. They're used to dealing with uh, dangerous situations, perhaps. In this particular case, I mean, Perhaps it helped me to sort of better understand uh, from some outside experiences what it's like to take care of uh, patients uh, who are under guard or perhaps uh, victims of trauma. But the truth of the matter is you don't need a military experience to care for this patient or any other. This is, this is what the medical center and other academic medical centers do all the time. So it may have helped me personally, but I don't think it, it's necessary to care for this type of patient. And the your other nurses and doctors, they have military experience? Some do, some don't. Um, most importantly, what they have is experience caring for people in their particular unit. I cannot give enough credit to the nurses who work in this unit. It's, it's not an easy job to do, but they do a fabulous job. They have great leadership, and uh, through the years, they've always you know, taken care of patients because that's what they're there to do. I think it's your time. It's almost 11. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's so much. We appreciate this, it. So much. Uh, I'd like to stand here for one more sure, minute. Sure, of course. Uh,